Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to our event, The Future of the Constitution and the Supreme Court, um, and to, to encourage everyone to participate, to leave questions in the question and answer um, as we go. I'm Brian Rosenwald. I am the director of the Red and Blue Exchange at the PIDEA program at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm going to introduce the, the program and tell you a little bit about what we do, and then I'll introduce our panelists, um, and, and then we'll jump in. So I, I want to start by saying that the SNF PIDEA program is a hub um, for dialogue in undergraduate education. Uh, we, we work to help um, add knowledge, skills, ethical frameworks, and experiences so that we produce um, informed, engaged, and effective community members and leaders in society. Um, we we want to encourage free exchange of ideas, um, civil and robust discussion of divergent views, and student community wellness. And we have fellows um, and, and SNF PIDEA courses in addition to events like this. So if you're a Penn undergraduate in the audience, do check out our website and look at the courses, look at the process for becoming a fellow. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff that, that we do that you're welcome to join in. Um, and the Red and Blue Exchange is, is part of the PIDEA program and part of the PIDEA mission. And we want to engage with a broad range of ideological and political perspectives and to tackle the, the biggest, most important issues from those different perspectives um, and, and to foster respectful dialogue and debate in a time where admittedly that's sort of in short supply in, in American um, politics. And we wanna thank the, the Gamba Family Foundation and John Gamba for enabling this program and enabling events like this one. Um, we do several of them every semester that, that allow us to further this mission. Now I would like to introduce our August panel. Um, I'm only gonna give you the, the highlights of the panel's um, bios and they'll have them turn their cameras on as I introduce them. But um, I, I'm only gonna give you the highlights because we wanna hear from them more than hear about them. Um, but go in order, Akil Reed Amar is the Sterling Professor of Law and Political Science at Yale, where he teaches constitutional law. He has won countless awards from the Bar Association, the Federalist Society, and been cited in, by the justices in more than 45 Supreme Court cases. Um, Amanda Hollis Brusky is Professor of Politics at Pomona College and Chair of the Department. She's written uh, several books on the conservative legal movement and Supreme Court, um, con Consequences, the Federalist Society, and the Conservative Counter-Revolution, um, and Separate but Faithful, the Christian Right's Radical Struggle to Transform Law and Legal Culture. Um, and she's a frequent commentator in the media and in all kinds of cool places, and she has provided expert testimony in the House of Representatives as well. Kate Shaw is Professor of Law at Cardozo Law School and co-director of the Florsheimer Center for Constitutional Democracy. Um, she was in, worked in the White House Counsel's Office and was a clerk for Justice John Paul Stevens of the United States Supreme Court. And I believe Kate is joining us on campus in the spring at, at Penn. Um, Rogers Smith uh, is a, a August political scientist who was with us at Penn, um, is now enjoying a well-deserved retirement. Um, but he is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences Fellows, um, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, um, and a member of the American Philosophical Society. He was Associate Dean of Social Sciences from 2014 and 2018, and President of the American Political Science Association from 2018 and 2019. And for those with a pen, he was the founding director of the Andrea Mitchell Center for the Study of Democracy. Um, a really wonderful center that does all kinds of good things on campus. And last but certainly not least, Keith Whittington is William Nelson Cromwell, Professor of Politics in the Department of Politics at Princeton University. Um, professor Whittington has also published widely, um, including several books and articles, um, including Impeachment in a System of Checks and Balances, The Supreme Court as a Symbol in the Culture Wars. I think we might get to that topic uh, tonight and others. So we are thrilled to welcome the, this wonderful panel to Penn um, and, and to, to really dive into what I think is one of the most critical issues in our politics today, which is the, the role of the Supreme Court and the, the cases that they hear and the decisions that they've been making. So I want to start with kind of the most basic question for, for all the panelists, 
which is to assess the state of the Supreme Court in constitutional law. Where are we? What do things look like? And anyone can jump in and get us started. Well, I'll start just to get us going, even though uh, many of the other panelists have more to say. I do think as a scholar of American constitutional development that we are at a critical juncture in the history of the court. Uh, we have seen since the creation of a conservative supermajority uh, with the three Trump appointees uh, that the court has moved further away from uh, the median views on constitutionality of uh, uh, the American public um, and has moved uh, significantly uh, to the right in ways that have uh, caused a great deal of controversy. And the question of whether uh, this new supermajority of conservatives will continue to drive the court um, in a uh, uh, powerful uh, direction challenging uh, much settled American constitutional law is uh, one of the central issues of our time. I'll just jump in to punctuate what Roger said with a little bit of data. My side hustle is uh, at the Washington Post monkey cage blog and I serve as an editor there and we ran a piece in um, September and on in middle of October about sort of trust and legitimacy in the Supreme Court. So I'm pulling from that. And uh, they draw from the Gallup data. It was a poll taken between September 1 and September 16 of this year that found that only 7% of Americans have a great deal of trust in the Supreme Court. And that is the lowest reading since Gallup started asking this question in the 1970s. So more than that, over 58% of Americans disapprove of the Supreme Court. Again, the lowest reading since Gallup started asking that question. So I wanna echo what Rogers is saying here and point out the fact that the only real power the Supreme Court has is its legitimacy and folks don't trust it and likely don't find it legitimate. And I think that's, that's the place that we're in right now. Well, maybe just to push back a little bit against that, legitimacy is a pretty big word. And you start throwing it around, you say, oh, Barack Obama's not legitimate because he's <clears throat> born in Kenya or, you know, I didn't vote for him or something. And, and that has consequences. Or you say, oh, um, uh, Joe Biden's not legitimate because I didn't vote for him. Um, and you see um, uh, January 6th. So um, legitimacy is basically, you know, and, and I'm burdened with a legal education and I'm not ashamed of it. You see, it's actually doing a thing called law, and we don't generally, um, in my view, do constitutional law just by sticking our fingers in, in the wind and, and, and do polls and, and the like. Um, and so, yeah, um, of course, not quite the court that I would want, truthfully. I'm a more of a Merrick Garland kind of fellow, um, but uh, the court still is... Um, of the three branches, you know, and, and see, if we're going to talk about what Americans know, the polls tell us that more Americans know the three stooges than the three branches of government. Now, it's not quite fair because they're actually five stooges, actually, when you add, add them up. And so that's, it's not quite straight up. But but of the three branches, oh, I would say the courts are the least dysfunctional um, and the least distrusted if you compare it to Congress and you compare it to the, the, the presidency. So um, uh, I'm not um, apoplectic yet. Um, and I'll, maybe I'll say a couple of words about legitimacy as well. I mean, I think that Akhil's right. It's a big and dense concept and it has, you know, a bunch of different forms. I think Richard Lazarus has done good work sort of unpacking different strains, what we mean when we talk about the court and legitimacy, you know, sociological legitimacy, right? Is it accepted by the public legal legitimacy? Does the court seem to be acting and reasoning in a register of legal decision making? But those two are not disconnected. I mean, there's other kinds of democratic legitimacy, substantive legitimacy, but just, I mean, I, I think that the, the data that Amanda sites I don't think is is you know necessarily and to suggest that there's something concerning about those kind of historically low levels of confidence in the Supreme Court is I, I think not the same thing as saying the unpopularity of particular decisions in some way renders the court illegitimate I think that what it seems and I I don't I I think this data is always a little bit hard to figure out how to parse or what to make of um but 
just speculating, it seems to me that one of the things we're seeing the public respond to is concern about how the court goes about the task of judging, of legal decision making. Um, and I think we will probably get to the shadow docket, but one thing I think that we kind of all as commentators on the Supreme Court have an obligation to do is to talk about the things that the court does that are not the marquee cases. And of course, we should talk about Dobbs and Bruin, and we will. But when the court, you know, twice in the last uh, six weeks in unreasoned decisions puts on hold stay orders that were entered to block executions from being administered without one whisper of reasoning, right, takes these reasoned decisions and undoes them without providing reasons, directs the the ultimate punishment, right, be meted out on individuals. Um, and it actually, in both cases, the executions were unable to go forward um, in one case because of the precise reasons that had led to the stay below. But these are the kinds of things that the court does that often do happen, right, in the shadows on the shadow docket. And and I do think that just insofar as reason giving is kind of the baseline requirement of the task of judging, I think the court is actually failing that really low bar. Um, and so that may be related to some of the data that, that Amanda started out by highlighting in terms of public trust and confidence. Just to pick up a couple of those threads that have come up, I mean, Clearly, we went through a very long period of relative stability on the court. Uh, we had a period in which either Sandra Day O'Connor or Anthony Kennedy, often both, uh, were the media injustices. Uh, we had pretty clear idea then about where uh, law stood. Lower courts had a pretty clear sense of direction as a consequence. Uh, that was unusual. It's just how uh, long-lived uh, that stability was. That's now been shaken up. We clearly have a different equilibrium on the court, we have a much more conservative court uh, than we have before, but we also have justices um, simply who aren't in the same space that O'Connor um, and Candy necessarily were. And as a consequence, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and a lot of movement um, over the next few years as the court settles out and sends signals um, about how it thinks about some of these issues with a new uh, judicial lineup. I don't think that's necessarily uh, surprising, um, but it does mean that we're going to get a lot of new case law, new precedents being handed down um, over the the next uh, few years, and it's clearly going to be more conservative uh, than it was uh, before. The other thing I would note about public confidence is, unfortunately, I think the court is, is suffering uh, some of the same uh, lack of trust in institutions uh, that's being felt across the entire landscape of American society. Um, so while it is disturbing that the court um, uh, scores lower on these kind of public approval and public confidence ratings uh, than was true earlier, um, it's still notable that the court scores better uh, than other American political institutions, which really is not encouraging about American government uh, more generally. And of course, that's also true about other major institutions uh, in American society, including universities. Um, and so there's just a lot of distrust out there um, about public institutions as a whole. I think it is true that we need to separate out thinking about what legitimacy means in the context of the court, how much we ought to read into these kind of public confidence measures. But I do think we have a disturbing uh, tr uh, trend going on uh, in American public more generally, um, in which there's just an awful lot of distrust um, of major institutions and the court uh, is not unique. I want to get to a follow-up, but I, I to the person who asked the question about what the shadow docket is, I suspect we're going to come to this right after this follow-up, and we will explain it um, because it is something that if you're not following the court can be confusing. But I, I want to start with the follow-up. Um, should the court, should the justices care about the data that Amanda was talking about? Is this, you know, should they ignore it or should th this be something where they say, hey, we, we may have a problem here? Well, I think especially on issues of legal ethics, they should definitely not ignore, because um, um, that's coming from uh, folks who are, in the main, many of us, defenders of the court, friends of the court. Um, and um, and when your friends are telling you something, um, you know, my life experience is listen to your friends. Um, that's why they're your friends. So I think especially on issues of, of legal ethics, um, um, uh, the, the court should definitely um, pay attention. I'm not sure um, in the quadrant of unenumerated rights, I actually think public opinion is relevant. It's one of the, the bases of unenumerated rights. Now, if something's in the text, we enforce it in my view, whether it's popular or not. Um, but unenumerated rights, actually public opinion does have a, a truthfully in my view, a, a legitimate role, but I'm not sure you know, since Rogers was talking about where the court is compared to uh, the median American, you know, um, 
my party, the Democratic Party, controls the House, the Senate, and the presidency, and we still can't get actually a, a Reproductive Choice Act through. Um, and yet there, some folks we're going to talk about, um, uh, Dobbs, want to constitutionalize something and keep constitutionalizing something well to the left of uh, the current um, political configuration in which my party, so to speak, won the trifecta, House, Senate, and President. So, so um, uh, on some issues, truthfully, that some of the things that I and my fellow liberals believe are not quite as popular as I wish they were. Now, on same-sex marriage, um, which we're also, I hope, going to talk about today, I don't think it's actually on the table judicially or in America. And you just saw some really interesting developments on that this, this day, this week. Yeah, yeah, I'm, sure that, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, I'm sure Chief Justice Roberts is going to pay attention uh, to these kinds of numbers. That's generally often true with Chief Justices in particular. Uh, they worry about these kind of institutional effects and, and what the court's standing is uh, in society more generally. Um, I'm not sure, though, it makes a lot of sense for the individual justices to be thinking too carefully about these issues as they go about making their decisions um, on the court. Um, for the most part, I think the best they're likely to be able to do is to think that uh, if they just do the job as best they understand it, um, then hopefully uh, the public will be persuaded uh, that they're doing a good job. It's very hard, I think, for the justices to um, uh, really try to uh, navigate uh, toward public opinion. And moreover, the public opinion is pretty divided about these issues. One thing we know about the public and its response to the court is partially they respond to their substantive approval of individual decisions the justices um, are making, especially on very hot button issues. Um, and with the court, with its particularly low um, uh, confidence and approval right now, uh, one thing we're seeing is a lot of liberals are pretty unhappy with the court about how they're deciding abortion and gun rights and the like. But on the other hand, a lot of conservatives are pretty unhappy with the court about how they decide election disputes um, and COVID policy. And so if you're a justice trying to figure out, well, how do I improve, improve my uh, public opinion rating? It's not always going to be very obvious as to what the right move is going to be. Um, and I mean, I, uh, maybe I'll say again, it seems to me that there's a distinction to be drawn between, um, no, I think most of us think that as a general matter, the justices in a lot of cases shouldn't put too much stock in sort of public opinion on individual constitutional questions. It matters, I think, more in some than others. I think with the Eighth Amendment and some kind of liberty questions like public opinion and those things matter much more than with respect to other structural constitutional uh, arguments potentially. Um, but as in terms of kind of general disapproval of the court's direction um, and decisional processes, I think that all of that probably should bear on the court's decision making. And I do think that the kind of speed and aggressiveness with which we have seen this new supermajority, as Roger started off by noting, really, you know, kind of upend large swaths of American law. I mean, I'm predicting forward a bit what I think they will do by June, but I, I, I'd be very surprised if I'm wrong about all of it. I think these two terms will see a great number of important precedents uh, fall um, and often, in, you know, like Dobbs, kind of as maximalist terms as one could imagine. Um, and I do think that sustained disapproval of that should be something that not just the chief justice, but the justices uh, more broadly should be mindful of. Rogers, were you going to go or can I jump in here? Go ahead. Um, so just connecting a few things that uh, my panelists have mentioned already, we know from political science scholarship that the real threat to le legitimacy, I'll use that term, even though it is loaded, is when the public views the judges as nothing more than politicians in ropes, right? It's not necessarily that they agree or disagree. That's kind of an acute effect and that'll dissipate. It's about whether or not what they see the judges doing um, is judging right, and judging in a way that is consistent with how our constitutional structure is, is set up. And since 2010, I think it matters that our court has not has been not just ideologically divided, but ideologically divided along party lines, right? So there are partisan judges now. Every judge who votes liberally is a Democrat. Every judge who votes conservatively is a Republican. And this gets to some of what Akil was talking about with the ethics questions. When that is the baseline, of how the public is viewing the court, then little things matter and they matter a lot. Um, so I'm sure we'll get to the Alito supposed leak of Hobby Lobby and maybe Dobbs and the relationship with sort of a Christian right um, patron. Um, this gets to some of what folks bring up about Ginny Thomas and Clarence Thomas. So things like that begin to matter more when the public suspects that what the judges are doing is actually politics and partisan motivated, not individual legal reasoning and judging. 
I'd modify that just a little bit in uh, stressing that um, what we're seeing now since the creation of the supermajority is something new. Like I, like Keith, I was going to stress uh, that Chief Justice John Roberts um, came in promising to try to be a consensus builder. He's very concerned about the uh, court as an institution, and he had considerable success in uh, producing unanimous or near unanimous opinions uh, up until uh, the uh, completion of the Trump appointees. Um, and since then, uh, the court has been uh, moving in a more aggressive direction as uh, uh, Kate underlined. Um, and so uh, I don't think that the court generally should decide by looking at public opinion how cases should be resolved, but um, uh, it is true that we're in uh, a new period where uh, the uh, lack of trust in the court may be more serious than in the past. And I'd add uh, on the ethics questions that um, what we're seeing now is also novel too. We don't really have any historical counterpart uh, that I know uh, to the question of whether Clarence Thomas should have recused himself because uh, his wife may have been involved in the election disputes uh, that um, he's uh, uh, helping to decide or refusing to have the court address in uh, some instances. Uh, so we've got uh, some novel problems for the court uh, right now. Um, and it's possible uh, that uh, the court might feel uh, that it's gotten too far out on a limb and uh, uh, has too much popular disapproval now and will return uh, to the course it had um, uh, in much of the last decade. Uh, but that very much remains to be seen. So I'm going to declare... Oh, can I just jump in and just say one quick thing, Brian? Is that okay? Um, um, just to make it kind of explicit, some of the historical trends that Amanda alluded to, just for folks who are not quite as steeped in this history as uh, all of us are, right? It, it really is a pretty recent development that you have this kind of perfect alignment between the votes of justices in any individual case and the kind of partisan preferences of the presidents who appoint them. So Amanda, you referenced 2010. So you had until 2009 and 2010, um, David Souter and John Paul Stevens, both Republican appointees who were quite liberal for most of their time um, on the Supreme Court. And even more recently, right, Anthony Kennedy, um, until 2018, right, a you know, Republican appointee who not only voted with the liberals in a lot of cases, some but not all of the abortion cases during his time on the court, um, but not only voted, you know, to uphold gay rights, but wrote all of the big major gay rights opinions out of the court. And again, a Republican appointee. So it is really only with the addition of the three newest justices that you for the first time have kind of perfect alignment on both left and right between, you know, political preferences of appointing presidents and the justices votes. There just really isn't any directly on point historical precedent for this configuration in history and she's right and and but that's in part because of the polarization of parties more generally which is what political scientists of a certain ilk you know were advocating in the 50s and 60s you see um uh, parties that actually stood for something but we got no liberal republicans left no conservative democrats left in, in the senate in the house in part because of realignment triggered by 1964 civil rights act 65 voting rights act and and the the consequences so all the liberal Rockefeller Republicans, you know, became Democrats, the Jim Jefferses of the world and the David Souters and, and the John Paul Stevenses and, and all the Southern conservatives, you know, uh, uh, became Republicans. And, and so you have a, a, a Senate in which the most liberal Republican, Susan Collins, is still to the right of the most conservative Democrat, Joe Manchin or Kristen Sinema, on, on most issues. So it's not just in the court, it's in America more generally. It's a fee, just like Keith said, you know, the dissatisfaction is not just with the court. And these are broader features, not and not just, he said, vis-a-vis -vis government, but vis-a-vis -vis the media too. Um, and journalism and universities, which are um, more polarized in various ways than than we've seen I, I think almost ever okay maybe the 1850s uh, which is not a very helpful I'm mean, hopeful um uh, analogy but um but, but but maybe you'd have to go back to the 1850s 
we're painting a very optimistic picture here. Of, of I'm, not yet apoplectic. I'm not apoplectic yet. Sumter has not happened. Okay. Um, uh, well, they, they, just, they just con they convicted the sedition act uh, in a seditionist yesterday. So I'm not yet apoplectic. Uh, Kate actually answered the question that I was going to try to clarify based on something in the Q&A. Um, so let me jump off of something that several of you have mentioned, which is, is it time for the court to be more transparent in some ways about what it's doing, about ethics, about process, um, and, and even laying out its reason? And, and we'll use that to springboard into the shadow docket and explain what that is. Maybe Kate? I mean, sure, I think the court is the least transparent institution in American public life. And if it is doing something totally different from the political actors elsewhere in government, then the transparency and other rules that apply to it might defensibly and reasonably look different than the transparency rules that apply to other actors and institutions in government. But the more it looks just like a group of political actors, the less defensible it feels to have so little transparency into the workings of the court. So things like who sees the justices who, you know, so the White House has visitor logs and, you know, it's actually a matter that is, you know, proactively released to the public who goes to the White House. Um, and it wasn't always the case, but it is now. So who sees the justices, who sits in the justices' seats during arguments? These are not the most pressing questions of the day, but I think just sort of an illustrative example of how little we know about just what happens, you know, kind of both physically and more abstractly within the building of One First Street. So, um, so yes, I think that they're, they don't tell us when they're speaking or to whom. They don't give the public access or the media access to many of their speaking engagements. Um, obviously, as we all learned the New York Times this week, um, there are deliberate influence campaigns that at least one, maybe more who knows, launched at the justices. And that's not the fault of the court exactly, but it is, I think, telling that there just aren't mechanisms that would bring to light in the ordinary course some of the activities that we saw reported um, uh, this week. And so, yes, I mean, what that looks like did you have, should you have to register to lobby the Supreme Court? I mean, I've had all of these thoughts in the last couple of days that you have to register and like make it public if you're going to lobby members of Congress. We, you know, it should be that just the briefs and the arguments are what the justices base their decisions on. But um, if we feel concerned about how accurate or true that is, like I do think that um, opening up, you know, mechanisms of additional kind of transparency and accountability in the Supreme Court is well worth considering. And did you want to define shadow docket, Kate? Since you Sorry. Know yes, thanks, Akil. Sure. Yeah, so it's just a, a, a sort of catch-all term coined by University of Chicago law professor Will Bode, although I think most associated now with Steve Vlodic at the University of Texas, who's got a book by that title coming out in a couple of months. But it just refers to basically everything the court does outside of its ordinary um, briefing, oral argument, and sort of full consideration decisional processes. So the court considers like on the merits something like 60 or 70 cases a year now. It's very low compared to other points historically. Um, but in addition, it gets a ton of requests for emergency relief. Um, and those are things like, you know, stays um, or the lifting of stays, um, things of that nature. So to intercede at an early stage in litigation. And that was something that was actually pretty infrequently both tried and pretty and even less frequently successful until the Trump years when the federal government, the Solicitor General's office under President Trump was extraordinarily successful in getting relief on the emergency or, or shadow docket. Um, so to get, you know, and 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 that involved both um, federal and also uh, there there have been states now sort of post the Trump years that have gotten emergency relief as well, primarily conservative states uh, seeking relief um, or conservative actors in more liberal states seeking relief from liberal policies around things like COVID. Um, but also there's a lot of shadow docket activity around election regulation. So it's things the court does outside of its ordinary decisional processes that sometimes involve just orders with, as I said at the outset, no reasoning at all, um, and sometimes very short paragraph or a couple of paragraph opinions, but they make law in you know every bit as real a way as the court's actual written opinions, um, and yet they're subject to a far more abbreviated and even less kind of transparent process uh, than the one that typically applies in the court's ordinary work. I'd throw in that uh, defenders of the court used to say that um, uh, it was the most transparent institution because it had to give reasons for all the actions it has taken. But as Kate has pointed out, um, uh, even that has gone into decline recently. Now to be, um, to bend over backwards to try to be as uh, generous to the court as possible, Kate does rightly remind us that many of these shadow docket cases are actually kind of interim um, uh, rulings um, about 
uh, cases that are still percolating up. Um, uh, now, that's not going to be true in a death penalty case. That's that's rather final um, uh, when the court uh, um, uh, basically uh, green lights a, a, an execution. The Supreme Court um, doesn't have as much maybe legal um, uh, effect for uh, uh, folks other than the, the particular um, uh, defendant, uh, the capital uh, defendant uh, at issue. But some of what we're seeing, frankly, is the, the product of a very big shift that my uh, colleagues have identified on the Supreme Court, the three new Trump judges, justices, um, no longer O'Connor or Kennedy in the middle, a big shift in the median, that's what Rogers said and Amanda and Keith, actually all of you said, Kate. Um, so when you have that, you know, because there are only nine, you, 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 you replace three, that's a big shift and a big shift you know, we, you know, the political scientists, uh, um, you know, I wear that hat too, in, in the median um, uh, 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 justice out of nine, you know, five out of nine, and you haven't had a comparably dramatic uh, shift on in the lower courts. There are a thousand plus or minus lower federal court judges compared to, you know, in effect, 10, um, you know, nine on, on the Supreme Court, you know, that's just an order of magnitude, you know, 100 federal um, appellate judges, plus or minus a thousand federal district judges, just to keep the math easy, just think 10, you know, a hundred, a thousand. Um, and if the lower courts um, have not shifted so dramatically and the Supreme Court has, you're gonna have some very serious vertical tensions within the judicial pyramid. And you're seeing some of this played out. And one final technical legal point, the Supreme Court has told lower courts, you can't anticipate an overruling. We get to change our um, precedents, but you can't. And and so um, whether it's at, at Texas SB 8, which we may talk about, which you know uh, then uh, was connected to the Dobbs case or other things, lower courts are bound by sort of different rules of precedent than the Supreme Court itself. And that's going to manifest itself just analytically in some real tensions in um, some of these cases actually percolate up. And one final thing, um, which I know, Brian, you, you, you gave us a cheat sheet earlier you wanted us to talk about, litigants, ideologically motivated litigants can sometimes pick which you know, place they're going to litigate something, at least at trial, and, and they forum shop. And if you're a conservative, you want to go to Texas. And if you're a liberal, you want to go to California. Um, and this is connected to a, another, it's, I know it's a technical legal issue, but since we're talking about shadow docket and legal ethics, questions of national injunctions are very relevant here as well. So I'm, I was going to take us in a different direction, just circling back to the initial question, Brian, you asked about, should the Supreme Court be more transparent? And one of the things that struck me thinking about it is likely the most transparent it's ever been in some ways, right? They are now streaming since COVID, they've started streaming their oral arguments. We all we always had to, unless you were in the courtroom, you had to wait for a transcript to be uploaded and the audio to be uploaded to get a sense of what the court was up to. I think of Rick Hassan's work on the rise of the celebrity justice, sort of mapping the appearances of Supreme Court justices over time and noting just how much more visible they are, um, mostly to groups of elites and academics and other lawyers, right? Not necessarily to the general public, although the exception here is Sonia Sotomayor, who made it a priority to actually visit with groups of kind of low-income high school students and then get sort of more among the people. And so it strikes me that um, they're more out there in a sense than they've ever been, but circling back to our earlier conversation, when you're already a little suspicious of what the justices are doing and you don't know a whole lot about what they do in the first place, then when you see them talking with certain elite groups over and over again um, and holding audiences with certain ideologically uh, um, identifiable groups, then it actually might raise your suspicion um, even more about what they're, what they're up to. And of course, we just had the experience of having a justice on campus last month. Um, as part of our new president's inauguration, Justice Kagan did a conversation with her um, and, and said some pretty interesting things. So we, they, they are out there um, in ways I remember the first time I heard the, the justices in the Rehnquist court was when they rushed out audio of Bush v. Gore, and you actually heard their voices for, for a change. Um, building off of what Akil said, just because I'm not 100% sure this is clear to everyone in the audience, the way this forum shopping works is you, you have some jurisdictions where there's only one district court judge or two district court judges. So you know how they lean 
and you file a lawsuit in those places, ideally also in places where you have an appellate court that is likely to side with your side. And I think it's worth um, asking the panelists whether this is a problem and something we need some rules to change for the simple reason that I think it was either Keith or Rogers said that, you know, the chief justice is worrying about some of this data. And one way that the court kind of got around some of these hot button issues has always been, well, you punt, you don't address them. But if you get things to the most ideological of the appeals courts, you can force them to weigh in in a lot of cases. So do we need to do something about national injunctions venue shopping? I'm not a fan of nationwide injunctions, uh, frankly, um, I, and I'm not a fan of it when it, it hurts my side, but I'm even not a fan of it truthfully when it helps my side. Um, uh, and more generally, the Supreme Court is going to maybe have to hear certain things um, more quickly. Um, and and that and and but they're going to have to give reasons now because we don't like this shadow docket, you know, judgment now reasons later or maybe never. Um, Potentially interesting feature of the kind of forum shopping you're suggesting, including trying to get things into friendly uh, circuit courts, is it may ultimately push the justice to decide more cases. Um, uh, so as Kate mentioned while ago, the court is deciding far fewer cases than it has uh, historically has a very small docket, even if you supplement it uh, with the shadow docket, it's still a relatively small number of cases. The court's hearing, which means most things are simply being settled um, at the circuit court uh, level. And at one level, that's sort of inevitable. Um, but nonetheless, you can imagine if you wind up with a lot of uh, more extreme uh, circuit courts, for example, uh, in either direction, uh, making particular decisions that may force the court's hand and require the U.S. Supreme Court to weigh in more, uh, to give more direction to the lower courts and reverse some of these uh, decisions emerging out of circuit courts. And maybe just one more beat on this. It seems like the kind of thing that the Chief Justice would be really concerned about, like the appearance that ideological plaintiffs are seeking out what they believe to be and are often correct in believing to be you know, sympathetic district court judges and getting, you know, like a federal loan repayment uh, plan or something enjoined by a district court nationwide. It's a huge impact. Um, and it really does make judges look like crass political actors. Um, and, you know, thinking back to Chief Justice Roberts doesn't, you know, get drawn out into sort of public disputes very easily. But remember, one of the few occasions during the Trump years that he was sort of moved to publicly respond was when uh, former President Trump criticized a district court ruling that had gone against him as having been issued by a, you know, Obama judge. And Roberts, you know, issued a very rare and unusual statement basically saying we don't have Obama judges, we don't have Trump judges, we have just, you know, federal judges doing their level best to do equal justice under law or something like that. But it clearly got under his skin. And obviously, like, I think the message being sent by these nationwide injunctions by um, judges who are carefully selected, because if you're the state of Texas and you can choose to file in Austin, where you may get an Obama appointee or a Biden appointee, or in one of the districts in Texas, Texas, where you have one or two judges, both of whom are Trump appointees, and you go every single time to the districts with the, just the Trump judges and get the result you want, it really does look like judges just are politicians in robes in a way that I think the Chief Justice should be quite concerned about. And I'd note that uh, uh, Trump uh, tweeted back, uh, Mr. Chief Justice, there are Trump justices and or Trump judges and Obama judges. And uh, that underlines how uh, the a uh, broader polarized political atmosphere that we have um, is contributing to uh, perceptions of the court as uh, made up of political actors in a way uh, that raises all the concerns that we've been addressing. Yeah, let me just emphasize that last point, because Trump's rhetoric, I think, was quite distinctive um, in how he talked about the courts and judges, how he criticized them. It's not unusual to have presidents criticizing judges, criticizing the court in general. But Trump was very specific about how he's doing it in ways that were quite unusual. He made it much more of a partisan um, attack by distinguishing uh, between Democratic and Republican judges or Obama and Trump judges uh, in the way that he did. I think it justified the chief justice uh, coming out in public in order to try to uh, push back on that. Uh, but I think it, it contributes to the kind of corrosive effect we're seeing now of declining confidence um, in judicial institutions more generally. If we see politicians uh, being quite so explicit and direct um, in trying to characterize uh, judges and judicial decisions they don't like uh, in primarily partisan terms. And I'll just add to what Keith said. I, it started long before that. It started when Trump held up that list of judges you know, with the stamp of the Federal Society and the Heritage Foundation and said, vote for me. 
And I will put one of these justices in Justice Scalia's seat. I will appoint justices in the mold of Justice Scalia. And I think that was unprecedented. And that really sort of co-branded Trump and the Trump administration with those judges. And so it's very hard to then disentangle and pretend you're not a Trump judge when you were on that list, right, of Trump judges. Although an interesting transparency issue, right? So on the one hand, we had said, wouldn't it be great if the court was somewhat more transparent? That's the most transparent we've ever been in terms of thinking about how presidents make decisions about what kind of justices ought to be on the court. Uh, and yet we're kind of uncomfortable with that. Uh, it's hard to get the balance right, I think, when we're talking about the court and what kind of transparency we want and what kind we don't. I mean, so one of the kind of transparency reforms people often wind up talking about is, wouldn't it be great if we had cameras in the courtroom and you could uh, uh, actually uh, show video uh, live here here of, of live um, argumentation from this court. I tend to think that's a terrible idea about how the court would behave in general. But I think it's hard to figure out what the right balance is about when we ought to be relatively transparent about the justice and the court's work and the things surrounding uh, the court and when we want to be less transparent about it. Uh, the, I just, five minutes before this Zoom began, I did an event with two federal judges here. I, this is by Zoom. I'm on the Yale campus. Um, both of them happen to have been appointed by President Trump, I do want to say one thing about, um, and they're not justices, they're judges. Um, many, many Trump appointed judges, in my view, absolutely did their job. Back to the very first question on legitimacy or on partisanship, when it came to these ridiculous claims of election fraud that were brought before them, whether they were Democrat appointees or Republican appointees, whether they were Trump judges or Obama judges to a person, they basically said these claims are utterly unsubstantiated. And some of the fiercest statements to that effect came from Trump appointed judges like my friend, former student, uh, Stephanus Bebus on the Third Circuit, who, who, whose chambers are, who used to be on the University of Pennsylvania law faculty, since this is sponsored by the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm very proud of him. And, and, and I commend his um, opinion to the audience because it's written, he's a very good writer, um, and it's written with um, distinctive clarity. Um, and it um, um, is absolutely the work of a judge and not a, a partisan, not a Paul not a hack. Um, and um, so that's why I'm not quite yet apoplectic because um, uh, I do think there were uh, um, many people, even um, I'm, 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 I'm fiercely opposed to Trump, always have been, um, but, but some of, but I, I would say some of the best parts of um, the Trump legacy are at least some of the people that he put on the bench who are um, men and women um, who really are judges. I was going to cite the same example of how uh, my former colleague at the University of Pennsylvania Law School is one of many Trump judges that indeed did uh, push back against phony claims of election fraud. Uh, that's absolutely right. Um, it is worth uh, noting, I think, that uh, when FDR was in his clash uh, with the court um, in the 1930s, uh, even though he took strong actions against it, um, he did not emphasize that uh, the justices uh, who were voting against the New Deal were Republican appointees. He did not make it a partisan issue. Uh, he objected to uh, their the substance of their constitutional views and offered alternative uh, constitutional views. Uh, that was, I think, a much more appropriate way uh, for the executive to criticize the court. And it does underline that while the Trump judges um, have done well on the election issue, uh, Trump himself uh, did play a historically novel and destructive role. Before we get to the substance of some of these decisions, there's a question from Ravi in, in the Q&A that I think is interesting. Um, and I, I think it gets to what Kate was talking about in terms of the aggressiveness of the court over last term and probably this term. Um, Ravi would like to know, would you say that the rightward shift is indicative of the court ushering in a new Lochner era? And if not, what distinguishes the conservatism we see today from that kind of vaunted conservative era of the early 20th century? Well, since we're talking about Lochner, I would want people to remember 
that um, there was a judicial revolution that overturned lots of precedents. And good liberals like uh, yours truly applauded that. We had an ideological president, you know, putting on, uh, filling the bench um, with um, folks who had a certain vision and they overturned a lot of precedents. That's called the switch in time. And I was for it. Um, and I'm still for it. Um, so the idea that we're seeing something- 1937, Akil, you weren't around then. <laughs> so so um, uh, I was for it. I, what I'm saying is before all my friends, some of whom are on this panel, start talking about the illegitimacy of the current court, you see, because, oh my God, they're overturning precedents. Because actually last time I checked, they did it in 37, they did it in 63, and I was for that last year or the year before um, when the Warren Court kicked into high gear. Uh, Philip Curland very famously said that the list of precedents overturned by the Warren Court looks like the table of contents of a constitutional law casebook pre-Warren, you know, a Brown overturning or, you know, DV, you know basically uh, dumping Plessy versus Ferguson, um, uh, Barnett overturning Gobitis. So to the extent that some people are shocked shocked that there's gambling that going is going on in Casablanca and that the court is sometimes overturning precedents and sometimes overturning precedents in ideologically charged ways. Oh my gosh, you know, I do not be shocked by that because 1937, 1954, 1963, um, Gabitis 43 and 40, um, what have you. So, but, so when we're talking about Lochner now, if you want to say what's different about Lochner, um, I think the court the justices in the majority would say, actually, um, the, the, the case that's more like Lochner is Roe versus Wade, and we are overturning that. We're more like 1937. Here's what they would say, just so you hear them, you know, very clearly. Um, they would say that um, Roe, um, that um, Lochner was based on substantive due process, and so was Roe. Lochner was um, taking something that the Constitution wasn't very clear in the Constitution, kind of property rights um, and 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 uh, protecting them um, and with a clause that actually was only about um, fair procedures. Um, uh, uh, Roe is doing maybe the same thing for liberty that Lochner did for property. They go further. Just so you hear them. I, I'm pro-choice. My brother cl clerked for um, Harry Blackman, um, who wrote Roe versus Wade. But conservative originalists think that Roe is not just Lochner, and therefore actually getting rid of Roe, it's ridiculous, they would say, to call that Lochner. They would say Roe is like Dred Scott. Dred Scott said that Blacks can't be citizens, and Roe says Fidei aren't persons, and Dred Scott takes a moral issue where states are disagreeing and nationalizes it in a way that um, certain um, uh, religious folk see as actually immoral. Roe, um, uh, uh, Dred Scott says, the Republican Party platform is illegal, unconstitutional. Actually, that's what Roe versus Wade says as well. So, so they would say on Bruin and Dobbs the following thing. Oh, you know, au contraire. They would say in Bruin, the Constitution actually does say something about guns. Um, and it doesn't say anything about um, um, this broad freedom of contract that um, may, there's a contracts clause, but that's not freedom of contract as such. So they would say Lochner was making stuff up, whereas we're reading the Constitution, it does say something about guns, and Roe was making something up, and we're overturning it, and actually we see ourselves as more akin to the critics of Lochner than the defenders. That's what they would say. Now, on the other side, you could say, you know, liberty and equality might be different than property. And it's one thing to overprotect property in the Lochner era. It's a very different thing to try to protect you know, bodily liberty and women's equality. And it's a mistake to conflate these things. There are many other things that could be said, but I just, there's a debate. Lochner is an essentially contested contest, uh, a concept in American constitutional law. And um, lots of people might agree that it's wrong, but for very different reasons. And some folks today, actually, like David Bernstein and others, you know, think it's right and are trying to revive it. I just want to jump in and um, offer a few notes on some of what Akil was, was talking about. So I don't know that anyone would make the argument that simply overturning precedent 
right, is, is inherently bad. We think Brown versus Board of Education, right? There's not a single liberal who would disagree that that was the correct decision to overturn Plessy versus Ferguson. However, what those other periods and those other courts, um, what this period is, uh, is different from those other courts, you know, the Lochner court, the Warren court, is the majorities that were overturning those precedents were not wholly and exclusively aligned with one political party. And they were not wholly and exclusively uh, making decisions that favor the values and politics of one political party. You know, Earl Warren was, was appointed by a Republican, famously, right? Appointed by Eisenhower. William Brennan, the liberal lion of the court, appointed by a Republican. We've already talked about the ways in which ideology did not map on to political party on the court until very recently. And so I do think, Akhil, that what this uh, conservative supermajority is, what is distinct about this is that anything they do, whether it can be defended on these grounds that you're articulating, it's like Lochner, it's not like Lochner, right, um, is going to be perceived through that lens. And that is not going to come to an end anytime soon, right? We're talking about decades, possibly, of this, you know, absent some kind of court reform or structural change to the court. And so that's why I think this period is different. I don't think Lochner is the right shorthand to use to talk about this period of the court because it's fraught in the ways that you're that you're describing. And of course, Earl Warren was not just a Republican; he was the former Republican vice presidential nominee. Um, so, so it was a, a very prominent Republican. And, but the, wanna... and, and the and the person on the court most like him who grows up literally in his shadow play um, um, who, uh, who, whose house Warren visited on many occasions whose sister was best friends with Warren's own children is Anthony Kennedy who grows up as a Republican in Sacramento where Earl Warren is the governor of the state and Earl Warren was the Democrats favorite Republican in certain ways yeah he ran for the vice presidency and if Dewey had defeated Truman he would have been vice president of the United States but there was a term in which he actually won re-election on both the Democratic and Republican tickets and uh, um, uh, uh, since Kate mentioned, um, and, and uh, Amanda also, um, uh, 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 and others, uh, Kennedy as the, um, 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 the previous median justice, um, um, uh, Keith, he was a Republican who, uh, nominated by a Republican president, but confirmed by a Democratic Senate, you see, because they borked Bork and, and then Ginsburg went down. All the justices today, with one exception, are the product of unified government. They're Democrats appointed by Democratic presidents and confirmed by Democratic senates, or Republicans confirmed by uh, nominated by Republican presidents, confirmed by Republican senates. Except Clarence Thomas, and oh, that was ugly. Um, so yes, um, Amanda is so right, but it's not a unique flaw or fault of the current justices. They are in an era in which there is pure. Um, two-party polarization of a sort that we have not had in American history. I agree with that. I want to come back to the question of a new Lochner era uh, to draw another contrast. Um, uh, I agree with Akhil's points about constitutional interpretation, but when we look at constitutional substance, uh, the central theme of the Lochner era was economic liberties, economic rights, property rights. Um, uh, I think that's important for many of the current conservatives on the court, but the number one issue for them is religious liberty, uh, religious freedom. And uh, uh, they are pursuing an agenda uh, in which that concern um, addresses a wide range of topics, not uh, simply um, uh, issues immediately involving uh, churches, uh, but uh, issues of um, education, employment, um, uh, abortion rights, of course, and much more. Uh, so uh, I think the question of how aggressive they will be in pursuing a religious liberty uh, agenda uh, in the way that the Lochner court pursued uh, an economic agenda um, uh, is, again, one of the biggest questions uh, facing us now. And I actually want to jump off of that. Um, we will get to Dobbs, I promise, momentarily. But I'd like to start with that religious liberty issue, because it does seem like the thing that animates at least 
uh, two or three of the justices more than anything else. And so what is the state of kind of religious liberty um, case law? And really, you know, is the establishment clause still meaningful in any way with this particular court? And where do we go from here? I know Amanda's written a lot about that. Yeah, but Kate, I'd love for love to hear your thoughts first. I, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, but I also want to hear from you, Amanda. So I'll try to be brief. Um, yes, I mean, I think that that to be honest, the court's differential treatment of the two religion clauses in the First Amendment, the free exercise clause on the one hand and the establishment clause on the other, I think is both independently extraordinarily problematic, but also I think is part of the reason it's very hard for me to take what this court does when it sort of says it's doing constitutional interpretation uh, seriously, right? So it is, it sort of has this selective kind of fixation on particular constitutional provisions, which it's willing to read in ways that sometimes create enormous social change, um, and it is perfectly willing to completely disregard others. And I'm just not sure what principle theory of constitutional interpretation would allow that. So we have two clauses in the Constitution, free exercise and a prohibition on government establishment of religion. And for years, I think political actors and school officials and, you know, sort of people in civil society, like we all sort of understood there are a couple of their competing imperatives, push and pull, and we need to figure out how to give as much expression to each of these constitutional values as possible. And the Supreme Court has basically come in and said, we don't actually care about the prohibition on the establishment of religion. And I'm just not sure on what basis that it can be defended. And I think it's true about, I mean, you know, Akhil, you said when abortion and guns are different because the Second Amendment is a, you know, textual guarantee of right and abortion is a little bit more amorphous. But of course, the court doesn't care at all about the Ninth Amendment, which says pretty clearly that rights not enumerated are not, you know, denied. Um, and so, uh, so I do think that that the selective elevation of particular constitutional provisions and rights over others is one of the most troubling uh, trends on display in the current court. And I think it's independently significant in the religion context, but also more broadly significant. So I'll just say one of the more interesting turns that I've seen with the addition of the Trump justices is the reframing of establishment clause cases, which are, you know, policies designed to effectively protect government from from entanglement with religion, although we don't talk about entanglement because lemon is dead. Um, the reframing of those cases as religious discrimination. And so tapping into that kind of liberal legacy of civil rights and sort of oppressed and marginalized minorities. And if you read some of the opinions in these cases, that really is the most striking element is the extent to which the justices are framing establishment clause cases, right? Efforts by government to kind of be neutral to religion as some sort of hostility towards religion motivated by animus and discrimination that needs to be rooted out. Um, so the idea that you would treat religion differently from other secular organizations is inherently discriminatory, where we have an establishment clause that basically guarantees that we are not going to treat, the government should not be treating religion necessarily the same as other secular organizations. So there's a lot to be said on this, but that's one of the more kind of striking elements of the, the more recent cases in my view. Yeah, uh, the way I'd put it is that the Establishment Clause isn't dead. The core meaning of the Establishment Clause is that there should be no uh, National Church of the United States, and there's not going to be a National Church of the United States. But um, uh, the position of the uh, conservative justices appears to be uh, that uh, you, under the Establishment Clause, religious groups can always claim um, equal treatment with secular groups. They can't be treated differently or it's discrimination as Amanda just said. But under the free exercise clause, they're entitled to special privileges, uh, special exemptions, special accommodations, special rights. And if you put those two positions together, uh, equal treatment under the establishment clause, but special privileges due to religious free exercise, you end up with a government that has policies uh, that consistently uh, favor at least the dominant religious groups. And of course, that does raise establishment clause concerns. I'm not sure, Rogers, we're quite there yet. Well, we're there, um, that. Yeah. I think that's where we're, well, I fear we're headed. Smith is still the law, a case called, you know, or, uh, Oregon versus Smith. Um, some of the accommodations um, have been statutorily based, uh, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is actually gutted, and my, uh, to some extent, um, um, in a case called Bernie, 
um, it doesn't really apply in a full-throated way against state governments, only against the federal government. So I myself um, am not a particularly um, apoplectic, once again, about the, the current turn of a doctrine in uh, the religion cases. I think you have to, um, I actually disagree with my friend Kate that there are two clauses that are kind of at war with each other. Um, I think they're two sides of the same coin and the basic idea is equality. Um, and the equality is gonna be um, a, an essentially contested concept and is it formal equality or substantive equality and does a common equality require accommodation and I'm not sure I wanna say it does and I'm not sure they've quite said it does except when it comes to um, uh, uh, regulations of internal church um, organization and who a church has to hire um, and, and the like, a, a case called Hosanna Tabor, the law of the church. But but more broadly, I would say, um, uh, in my view, the, <clears throat> it was a mistake on originalist grounds. Um, and I wrote a book about this and Amanda's written about this too, but uh, but um, um, and and people disagree. This is this these are difficult um, issues. But I think the core idea is not separation. And I think if it if we think the core idea is separation, that's going to lead to discrimination against religion in all sorts of ways. I think the core idea is equality. Now, equality is going to be a difficult concept, you know, um, um, uh, 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 even in, in and of itself. Steve Breyer had yet a third vision. There, there, there are different visions. There's a separationist vision. Um, or like French laicite, a certain um, uh, hostility to religion in public life. Clergymen shouldn't be um, politicians. Um, they, they shouldn't be even involved in politics. You know, Martin Luther King should stick to um, being um, a, a reverend and, and not get involved. That's a French sensibility. I don't think it's actually ours. Um, and I do think it would be wrong to say in the name of separation, oh, clergy people can't be religious. R a Warnock can't be a senator because he's a reverend or something like that. That's the kind of thing separationist thinking gets you. And that was the Burger Court and the Lemon Test and a wall of separation. I think that's wrong. On originalist grounds, I think the key idea is equality, and I think we're moving more toward that. But Rogers and, and Breyer's vision is different still. Let's not have religious polarization, divisiveness. Let's not have um, uh, religion um, uh, be um, a basis for religious warfare between different sects in America. Let's have social peace. Those are somewhat different visions of very diff big, broad um, clause of the Constitution. But I think Rogers is right that going forward, um, the question of religious accommodation will be a very big, I don't think they crossed that bridge yet. I'm not sure Amy Coney Barrett is quite prepared um, to repudiate, um, Scalia, she clerked for Scalia, Scalia's um, more narrow vision. So two final points, conservatives have shifted on this. The iconic conservative of an earlier era said no accommodations are required. That's Scalia, and that's not Sam Alito. I can let me tell you that. So, so that's one interesting shift. Amanda and others have written about it within, you know, uh, uh, the conservative movement. Um, you know, so uh, and and the second thing, just related, is I think conservatives today often feel a sense of a, um, a religious, I mean, religious conservatives, a sense of aggrievement, a sense that they are the victims of a, a ruthlessly secular society. There's been an alliance of conservative Catholics and conservative Christian evangelicals who used to be, you know, at loggerheads fighting each other. And now they realize, oh no, the, the, the real enemy is um, secularism. And, um, and, uh, and uh, so, so we're seeing some very interesting, broader cultural and political shifts playing out actually um, in court doctrine. Let me just echo a couple of those last points. Um, I'm going to be very curious to see what happens to Smith um, over time. I think we're in an interesting moment where Scalia's opinion uh, may not survive um, the new arrangement um, on the court, and it's going to. And so I think there's just a lot of uncertainty as to where we're going to land, both in terms of the exercise clause, but also uh, relative uh, to the establishment clause um, in the future. And and I think Akil's uh, last point is is an important one uh, in sort of a longer term uh, sense, not only sort of very immediately for the next few uh, terms, uh, which is to say, 
um, uh, that for uh, most of the time when we've had a robust um, uh, religious liberty uh, jurisprudence, the concern has been very much, how do you protect minority religions um, in a country uh, that has a, a predominant um, uh, religion? I think now increasingly uh, what certainly a lot of conservatives are worried about, and I think as a consequence, uh, several justices are going to be worried about, is we have a ra rapidly secularizing society um, in which religious adherents in general are going to see themselves um, as the, in the minority position position. Um, and that's going to be a very different world of how to think about uh, religious liberty, how to think about the Establishment Clause, and how the court tries to approach that. Um, if you think within the democratic process, it's religious adherents, including very mainstream uh, religious adherents, um, who are going to feel like we're the um, um, a minority that's under assault here. Um, and let me appeal to these uh, constitutional provisions in order to defend our rights against uh, majoritarian democracy. Got an unmute there. Um, let, let me take us to Dobbs because I know that we've, we've kind of hinted around it and I'll, I'll just open up a basket of kind of Dobbs issues. Um, first and foremost, was it the right decision? Do we think the court's going to kind of end up, they, they kind of present it as, okay, this is the way for us to get out of this thicket, but are they going to end up right back in it? Um, and, and if so, with what issues? Um, and do you think that the, the court wants to go further, the majority of uh, five wants to go further than they did in Dobbs. Um, yes, <laughs> I think given the opportunity, if you read Dobbs and you sort of sort of walk back kind of where that opinion came from, Mary Ziegler tweeted about this very recently, but the idea that that is such a, a movement opinion. Um, Alito's opinion is so quintessentially of the religious right and the way he constructs it and frames it. And um, sort of building the initial scaffolding for an argument surrounding fetal personhood. All right. So taking this movement that had since Roe had been a defensive movement um, and going on the offense. And so I think under the right circumstances, yes, will any of the backlash that we've seen since Dobbs and any of the sort of movement around court reform and some of the public opinion data we've been discussing, will that uh, force them to hedge a little bit or think twice? I don't know. Um, but I do think that given the opportunity, that is where a majority of the majority um, would want to go. I'm much more skeptical about that, I have to say. I, I don't think there's anywhere near five votes um, to uh, try to uh, constitutionalize um, protection for fetal life under the 14th Amendment. Likewise, I don't think there's anywhere near uh, uh, five votes uh, to go after same-sex marriage, for example, and go down sort of the larger track uh, that Thomas suggested um, of going after other substance due process uh, cases more generally. I expect the court is, is kind of done about how far they're willing to push this. I think there are maybe implications about what kind of new rights they're going to carve out. Um, but I don't think it gets the court out of the thicket uh, when it comes to abortion. Instead, we're just going to have a whole string of cases as lawmakers uh, press on the court on this. Um, some uh, conservative lawmakers probably being very aggressive about how they press on this, as they have been already. And it's going to force the court to have to return to this over and over again uh, in order to try to draw those boundaries. I don't know where we're going to land um, on that, but I don't think it's going to be as extreme as what um, Amanda's suggesting. I think I, I agree with every, oh, Kate, I'm sorry, please. No, no. I think I agree with everything that Keith said. Um, so uh, there, there won't be fetal personhood. And if you think otherwise, let's make some bets. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'll give you even odds. Um, uh, I don't think Obergefell and, uh, um, and equality cases are at issue. This was a substantive due process analysis and not an equality analysis. And, um, and, and um, I don't think other substance um, uh, um, uh, unenumerated rights cases are at, quite at risk like Griswold for a simple reason that takes us back to what we talked about before. I do think the counting approach, an approach that's sensitive to public opinion is a legitimate um, uh, uh, way of thinking about unenumerated rights. Kate mentioned the Ninth Amendment earlier or the, the um, uh, uh, privileges and immunities of, of citizenship that aren't all itemized. And one way you identify those is by counting states. Maybe that's not a poll, but it, it, it's a way of, of paying atten attending to public opinion. That is Glucksburg. And Roe flunks that because 
not in 1866 or 68, but in 1973, 49 of the 50 states actually had laws on the books that that um, violated Roe's precepts, maybe 50, depending on how you count New York. And and today, half the states you see, you know, um, are would pu pu are pushing back against what Roe would have constitutionalized, and we can't even have. And I'm pro-choice, you know, a statute passed by Congress today. So so, but that's not true of um, contraception rights, for example, um, or, um, you know, other unenumerated rights that I think uh, are, um, um, have, have much more support in uh, public opinion and, and state law. So I don't see um, Dobbs as betokening um, um, a, 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 a broad uh, unraveling of landmark cases uh, involving gay rights, same-sex marriage, contraception, um, uh, 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 interracial marriage and the like. I do think um, there's we're still in the thicket, both because if Congress ever passes a statute, there are going to be questions about protecting reproductive rights. Some of the conservatives are going to say, where's the enumerated power for that? Although I think Brett Kavanaugh in his concurrence signaled that he thought the Congress could do that. And that's important, okay? Because that, can, that, that you know, that, that's maybe um, uh, uh, then... Um, if Congress, uh, heaven forbid, from my point of view, we were, um, uh, 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 if you had a Republican trifecta, if they tried to pass a national abortion ban, oh, you know, that's, you know, that would come back to the court and, and that would be a, a totally different America if you couldn't, you know, get on a bus. Um, or get on a train or 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 take a um a, a, a drive um um and that the issue even without federal congressional legislation one way or another the issue that I think will come uh, to the fore about the right to travel and a right to actually go to a different state procure an abortion that's legal in that state and then return to your home state. Um, I think conservatives, uh, maybe even um, uh, 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 the most conservative would say, yeah, if you want to leave Missouri, you know, leave Texas, that's one thing. But if you want to come back and, and you've destroyed the life of a Texas unborn, it's not quite fetal personhood constitutionally, that the, the right to travel issues, the conflict of law questions are going to be very big going forward, as will the, the medical um, abortion issues, the the, the pills um, that um, uh, so th so we're in the thicket. Um, we can't avoid the thicket if if that's what you're asking, Brian. Yeah, I, I I agree that there will be more abortion cases that will come before the court. Just a question of when and what those cases are. Um, to kind of the initial sort of Amanda Keel disagreement about whether this is this is sort of the court is not going to actually enshrine fetal personhood in the Constitution, or this is just kind of a way station, um, and that's actually the destination. I, you know, I don't know. The surface of the opinion has all of this language about the importance of democratic deliberation, and obviously enshrining fetal personhood in the Constitution would remove from the democratic process, and precisely the way the opinion critiques Roe for having removed the abortion question from the democratic process. So I think on first read, it's easy to say, clearly they could never with a straight face then go, you know, do something that would again remove from the democratic process this question. But I actually do think that the more you read the discussion of democratic deliberation in the Dobbs opinion, the sort of thinner and stranger it seems. I mean, there's all this discussion of democracy, but what the only institution that's ever really invoked in the majority opinion is the state legislature. So state courts find rights in state constitutions, the people act directly through referenda and ballot initiatives do. Obviously, we've seen a lot of that recently. The federal government could act either to protect or to prohibit. And Alito just talks about state legislatures. That's the organ of democracy. And so that's kind of odd. Also, kind of what direction democratic you know, will could be expressed in is he talks a lot about states have been prevented from acting to, you know, protect life or restrict abortion. But this, you know, opens up state ability to do that. Kavanaugh in his concurrence says, sort of actually, as Scalia said in his dissent in uh Casey, you know, it's states can protect, states can prohibit, it's up to states. But Alito doesn't do that. He just talks about prohibitions and restrictions. There's also, I think, the kind of fundamentally anti-democratic quality to the method that the court uses to say how we identify whether this is in fact a right the Constitution protects. And Akil and I talked about this a little bit in the context of the Second Amendment. But here, I mean, you know, to basically the appendix to the opinion is just this sort of list of mid-19th century abortion restrictions that were enacted, each and every one of them, by state bodies that didn't have any participation by women in them, right? Like it's fundamentally yoking us to this past and the democratic decisions made by a very different polity as 
sort of enshrining constitutional meaning today. So, and there are, I think, other democratic deficits, but I do think that the lip service to democracy that is in the opinion, I think is not reason to take comfort that the court would not, you know, if the occasion arose, actually find a right to fetal personhood, although we should say they have turned down already some very quick opportunities to take up that question. But I don't think that means it's not ever going to come before the court. And I just renew my invitation to one and all. Um, I'm happy to take even odds bets on fetal personhood as a constitutional right. Um, um, uh, so um, that's, you know, we're, we're political scientists. We make predictions of a certain sort. You know, I'm willing to put my um, children's trust fund money uh, where my mouth is. <laughs> and I'll I'm just sure add your children to... appreciate that. Yeah. And... <laughs> The the SB, the, I, SBF or whatever. I will yeah. say that one of the things, having studied the Christian right for a while, is this possibility and this avenue keeps them motivated. Yes. Right? Because the question always was, what if they overturn Roe? It's like the dog that I caught agree. the car. No, what it, do they do now? It's, it's the great white whale. Yeah. yeah. So I do think that as long as there's that possibility that the door's open um, and that benefits the continued mobilization of the Christian right, right. and the GOP. Right. It's just, I actually don't think, knowing some of the conservatives on the court, that they could get wrap their minds around that quite. No, you could get, I'm not saying you couldn't get one vote, maybe two. After two, I find it really hard. I also don't know why you'd have a way station like Dobbs if that's where you're headed, right? I mean, part of my point very early on in this conversation was, right, we, Kennedy's off the court. We've got a new set of justices. It's a new median as a consequence. We're going to have to figure out where uh, their preferences are going to be about where the law is going to be uh, down the road. Um, uh, but they're in place. Um, and so if they really wanted to overturn Roe and, and say, and and with the right answer when you overturn Roe uh, is fetal personhood, they would have just told us that already. Um, um, and so I don't know why you would pause um, with the kind of opinion that we got in Dobbs if if we already have five votes uh, to go further. I think the answer is you don't have five votes to go further. I'm not even sure you have two votes uh, to go further. Maybe you only have one vote uh, to go uh, further down that track. Now, if Republicans win lots of future elections and conservative movement pushes in that direction, you get a whole new set of justices, then we have a different conversation. Uh, but with the current court, I don't see how you get there. And the elections that we just had, I, I say as someone who is emphatically pro-choice, were generally heartening to me. And 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 in part, it's because people like my friend Kate and others have been telling people, pay attention. I agree with them. So I actually don't want my, you know, some of what I say to 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 cause a certain, you know, um, a, a political complacence uh, 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 on, with my friends on on the left, because I I want them to be, you know, very very mobilized on, on this. And, and I believe it's legitimate for courts to take into account state laws and patterns in dealing with unenumerated rights. That's actually the Glucksberg analysis, which is not, in my view, um, a just a frozen in amber in 1868 when women didn't vote, you know, or um, uh, even 1973. I, I think Glucksberg, and as with cruel and unusual punishment jurisprudence, which Kate uh, alluded to earlier, permits attention to current um, accounting of of uh, of states and and people are voting and and not just for legislators but um, in initiatives and referenda and in, in direct citizen um, democracy in some places. I'd like to uh, build on the uh, first part of Akil's comments there, referring uh, to the results of the recent election and also the earlier uh, Kansas referendum. Uh, I uh, am uh, so old that I was actually an abortion rights activist um, as an undergraduate before the road decision was handed down. And I always felt like the late Justice Ginsburg uh, that while there are um, constitutional arguments for uh, a woman's right to choose that have force, it would have been better to win abortion rights through political processes, building a broad democratic consensus on how to respond to what is uh, uh, a very difficult uh, moral, philosophical, and religious question to which the Constitution doesn't provide any clear um, answer, um, the status of the uh, fetus. Uh, and more broadly, I do take a certain uh, solace in the current unpopularity of the court because um, speaking as a liberal, as a progressive, I think uh, that for more than a generation, uh, we have relied too heavily on courts um, and uh, courts 
interpretations of ambiguous clauses of the Constitution in order to win support for positions uh, that I think uh, should be uh, established much more routinely uh, through building democratic support to make those decisions um, if we can do so. Uh, and if we can't, relying heavily on an, elected, an unelected court to give us the answers we want um, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, ultimately counterproductive. Um, I think we're seeing uh, that uh, in the case of a woman's right to choose, uh, we can rely on democratic processes uh, to protect those rights um, in much of the United States, uh, uh, at least. Uh, there will be lots of cases involving uh, whatever legislation gets passed, as um, uh, my colleagues here have all pointed out, um, but that's not a reason uh, not to rely on uh, democratic self-governance as much as we can. So there are two other issues that I wanted to get to, and we probably only have time to get to one of them, and Kate kind of teed up both of them. So I think I'm going to go down the road less traveled, um, because Brune gets talked about more in gun rights. But there are these two big cases um, this term that get at the democratic process itself. Um, the first being Moore versus Harper next week, which gets at something called the independent state legislature theory. And then the court's also going to hear a case where they put on hold a lot of these maps where lower courts said after um, some of the southern states maps last year, no, you need to add another majority minority district um, that you have a, an impermissible, what you racially gerrymandered. And the Supreme Court put that on hold very, very early in, in the election year and is going to have to come back to it. So the, the, this area of democracy and voting rights, um, is the court moving things in a new direction here? What, what are the implications of these cases? Where do we think they're going to come down? If the court accepts this independent state legislature theory in its robust form, then count me as apoplectic. Then, because uh, uh, because this would be disastrous um, at every level, from the legal to um, the, um, the 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 much more broadly um, uh, political. Just in a nutshell, so that your our audience knows what we're talking about. Um, this is a legal theory that's basically John Eastman on steroids. Um, uh, it's uh, an idea that, and 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 what Kate said, and I hadn't really focused on it, and uh, now I'm even more nervous. She said, "Oh, you look at Dobbs, and they talk about state legislature, state legislature, state legislature." So um, uh, um, this is a case in which um, the question is: Can state legislatures, on their own, regardless of what a state constitution says, basically um, uh, regulate congressional um, elections and? Um, under a different provision of the Constitution, regulate um, a presidential uh, elections. Very concretely, there are about six states or so. Let's just take presidential elections. They voted for Joe Biden, but they have Republican state legislatures for reasons having to do with urban clustering and gerrymandering and, 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 and other things. If those states, and we're talking about Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, New Hampshire, um, 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 if those states, um, um, maybe Virginia, but but um, are allowed to pick presidential electors, those state legislatures themselves, who cares what the voters think? Well, then no pres no Democratic president can win in my lifetime. That, that's a very, very, very big deal. And the best argument that they can't do, they're going to say, oh, you know, uh, it says here in the Constitution, state legislatures can do that. You know, and I thought you were an originalist, Amar. Yes, it talks about state legislatures, but we proper originally believe that state legislatures are products of state constitutions. And, and state constitutions actually limit legislatures in various ways. And one of the ways in which state constitutions, for example, limit legislatures in a bunch of states, it says we, the people of Pennsylvania or Colorado or other states, are going to pick our presidential electors, not the legislature. So I hope I've gotten your attention because this is a very big deal. 
um, and it seems very technical. I'm I never go to court arguments. I'm actually going to the court actually just to see this. And Kate, I had no idea. I, mean, I think I'm going to sit and I, I clerked for one of the former justices. I'm going to sit, I think, in one of the boxes. And now you're telling me, oh, they're going to they're going to keep track of, of of who's sitting in that box now. I'm not trying to lobby them or do anything inappropriate. But I did file a brief and I would love it for your audience to read the amicus brief. And here's why. Um, it's co-authored by my brother, Vic Amar, who clerked for Harry Blackman, but also from for, by Steve Calabresi, the co-founder of the Federal Society, the national chair of the Federal Society. He's on our side on this. Serious originalists actually are almost a, 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 on one voice on this. So this, Amanda, will be a test of whether they're just politicians in robes or not. They're just kind of hacked because Republican Party is pushing one thing. But some of us serious originalists left and right are saying, no, no, no. So that's a really, really big case in my view. It's a case of the decade, especially if decided the wrong way. It would make Bush versus Gore look like a, a, a tiny, teeny little thing. Just a footnote on Steve Calabresi that if, I don't know if you read this coverage, but he was interviewed, I think, by Nina Totenberg and revealed that he was not allowed to refer to himself or they were not allowed to refer to him as a, a co-founder of the Federal Society in the but I just did. <laughs> of this discussion. So you've outed him, but that speaks to these very kind of problematic appearances of, of capture, right? That the Federal Society has a certain view that they need to distance from Steve Calabresi. And I agree with you. I, I wish that this were, he could publicly state that because I think it, it, it gives that view more legitimacy to have his support. But. I, I just want to echo Akhil in, in saying that the, a very strong form of the independent state legislature theory uh, would be a pretty big disaster. And I'm, I don't think the court's likely to go down that path. I think though that the uh, complication of this case in some ways um, is that the North Carolina State Supreme Court, which is what this uh, case involves, dramatically overreached from my perspective uh, in the ruling they made. And so it's gonna be an interesting challenge for the justices, um, I think, as to whether you can uh, construct something much more modest uh, than a strong form version of the independent state uh, uh, legislature theory uh, and, and from their perspective, uh, uh, correct um, aspects of what the North Carolina uh, Supreme Court um, had done. I think the justice is gonna be very tempted, or at least the majority of the justice is gonna be very tempted to want to try to find that path. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to see if they can. Um, and I think we also wanna be cautious not to overreact um, if they uh, find some path that they think is much more modest, um, but addresses the situation in North Carolina. And, and here's one key fact that I hope the lawyers emphasize, that these state judges who you think may have gone too far were elected by North Carolinians, and they're actually accountable to North Carolinians, and actually several of them were up for re-election and lost in North Carolina. So maybe actually, this is to Rogers's point and others, maybe that's actually how it should operate, not having the U.S. Supreme Court tell North Carolina um, what it state North Carolina state constitutional law really is and isn't, and whether they've overreached. Leave that up to North Carolinians. Um, and actually, in the last election, um, a reproductive rights, one big in a whole bunch of places, but actually the North Carolina Supreme Court justices were um, voted out. Um, uh, um, and that's maybe the, 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 the proper way to handle this stuff. It's also worth noting North Carolina is kind of a weird test case for this because it, this is about congressional maps and they're one of the few states where the governor doesn't play a role in this where it's not a usual legislative process. Um, so that's probably another layer of complication. Um, we've hit seven o'clock. So I want to end with one kind of forward-looking question. There are a lot of questions in the chat um, about the politicization of the court. Uh, someone asked about McConnell holding up Garland's nomination. Um, someone else asked, given the polarization of the court, it, you know, what would it take to reverse things? What kind of structural reforms? So are we headed in a direction where there's going to be some sort of clapback from the political branches or where there needs to be some sort of clapback from the political branches um, to, to deal with the, this, at least this perception that you now have a cluster of justices appointed by Republican presidents on one side and a smaller cluster of justices appointed by Democratic presidents on the other side. So where are we going? Where should we be going with this? 
um, in terms of kind of the, the court as an institution? I won't make a prediction, but I did testify before the Biden Judicial Reform Commission, and here were things that I didn't um, that I opposed, and here, and I'll tell you other things that I supported. I don't support um, uh, packing the court. I don't support uh, stripping it of jurisdiction. I do support term limits for justices. I support ethics statutes um, um, uh, for, for Supreme Court um, justices. We could also talk about um, regulations of the shadow docket and, and national um, in injunction reform. So that would be, you know, and, but if the court is utterly illegitimate, you see, back to the first question, oh, well, then we should just blow the damn thing up. But I don't think it actually is, which is why I'm, I, I, I really push back um, when people, you know, bring out the, the claim of illegitimacy in some really big, strong way, because when, the more we start talking about that and slightly loosely, the more that leads to stuff like January 6th, if the presidency you know, election was illegitimate or um, kind of slightly crazy reforms if, if the court is actually utterly illegitimate. So just to, I'm going to out Akil as being in a working group. Uh, we're in a working group together advocating for 18 year term limits, uh, statutory term limits. Um, I do think you need to regularize Supreme Court appointments. And will this um, resolve the entirety of the legitimacy issue? No. But if folks know that if they win elections, they're going to get two seats on the court. Well, then that at least gives people hope and opportunity and not dismissive of a court that they're going to write off for the next 30 years because it's so wildly out of whack um, with their values and preferences. And so I do think it'll take down the heat on judicial nominations, which have been out of control, if you've seen any of the recent ones. Um, and giving each president two picks, you may have to expand the court temporarily to implement that, but then you could get your way back to nine. And I do think that would solve some of our problems, at least in terms of public opinion and public trust and confidence in the court. I mean, I'll say I'm a fan of term limits and also of expansion, or at least to be honest, um, I think there's real value in political actors talking about these as live prospects. I think that you can move the court without necessarily implementing structural reforms, right? I think that sort of FDR um, episode is illustrative of that. But I also just think that the Biden White House and the Democratic leadership in Congress, you know, has been critical of individual decisions. And I think there are, it's a, you know, maybe a difficult needle to thread, but I do think there's a way to be quite critical of this court without resorting to Trump-like, you know, partisan accusations or, you know, without necessarily completely undermining legitimacy. But I do think there are ways to suggest the court is uh, too powerful so that it should be it should be less powerful. It should have less expansive jurisdiction. Potentially, it should have more members um, without suggesting it's a fundamentally illegitimate institution. But I don't I think the White House has been far too quiet on this. And I do think that the court is understandably not at all worried or chastened in its uh, approach because it doesn't really fear much political clapback. And I think that that becomes sort of self-fulfilling. So I do think that political actors should, I think that your working group should, you know, if it's clandestine working group for a good reason, but I mean, it would be great. I think if there was more public discourse that keeps these, um, you know, structural reform prospects front of mind um, kind of more broadly. The Supreme Court Commission obviously consider this stuff publicly, and since it shut down, a public debate about these questions um, has been pretty muted. Uh, Keith was on the Biden Commission, so he should get the last word on this. But um, uh, I'll just say that um, uh, I think most of the, I think all the justices honestly tell themselves they're trying to follow the law, and that it is um, uh, plausible to think uh, that the uh, uh, concerns about uh, public distrust uh, might lead them to curb themselves a bit, um, as opposed to the very aggressive agenda that they uh, have been following uh, recently. Uh, but on the question of um, institutional changes, um, I'm for term limits, but I think they would require a constitutional amendment, so I'm not sure um, they're really going to happen. Um, and I would just underline uh, that even though I don't like a lot of the court's decisions, I do believe that if you uh, enact clear legislation uh, that establishes the policies you want, uh, the courts are mostly going to defer to them. 
Um, I wasn't happy with the EPA case where they uh, reduced regulatory discretion, but you could solve that problem by passing a statute that gave the EPA clear authority to do what it had done. And so um, while we can pursue uh, court curbing possibilities of one sort or another, um, I will repeat that the uh, best way uh, to limit the undue influence of the court is to conduct democratic self-governance uh, well and effectively. Congress actually passing legislation, very quaint idea. Uh, Rogers, and, but I think it would uh, be helpful uh, to the system um, if they were able to do a little more of that. Um, I'll just note, I think the commission report um, uh, was quite good uh, in trying to um, overview um, a lot of the kind of reform measures uh, we're talking about, including uh, both court expansion uh, and term limits. Uh, the commission was asked not to make recommendations um, about those, and so uh, we didn't. Um, I'm personally uh, uh, pretty hostile uh, to court expansion and fairly skeptical still about uh, term limits, um, but there are interesting things to uh, talk about on this. But I just want to conclude, I guess, with a point that um, I, I was thinking about earlier um, and is relevant here as well. Um, that is to say, politically and historically, uh, not only are we in this very interesting and new uh, period in which we're dramatically polarized, and you see that on the court as well, um, but we're also in this very extended cycle in which neither of the two major parties have been able to get a very uh, durable majority. Um, and so one way we resolve these kinds of conflicts in the past um, is somebody just wins some elections. Um, and, and as a consequence, you get the 37 switch um, and Republicans don't get to come back <laughs> from a, as a consequence of that. And so as a consequence, you wind up with Earl Warrens uh, who wind up agreeing with what the New Deal Democrats did uh, precisely because the Democrats were so successful in winning elections. That's not the world we're currently living in. It's not the world we've been living in, in quite some time. Instead, neither party seems to be able to solidify a majority. Neither one can hold um, a chamber for very long, uh, elections go back and forth. So we're in this very weird moment um, of a very polarized system and with no stable majorities. And I keep waiting, uh, as many have for quite some time, uh, for one of the parties to step up and actually win a majority. Uh, and under those circumstances, I would expect the court uh, to fall in line uh, with whichever party winds up doing that, um, just as it has in the past. That is... Uh... Good place to end, I think, um, and to a reminder of what to focus on and watch moving forward. Obviously, we could have continued this conversation for hours. There are lots of, of topics that we didn't get to, and we will try to visit those in, in future programming. Um, I want to thank our panelists. That discussion was really, really fascinating. Um, I hope everyone in the audience uh, agreed with me, um, but I, I think that we, it was really useful um, as a dialogue uh, to engage on, on these issues. Um, I want to encourage everyone in the audience again to keep your eyes out for future Paideia programming, um, to check out our website, and also to for those who are undergraduates to look at our list of classes um, for the spring uh, and see if there's anything that catches your eye. So thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who was here, um, and have a wonderful evening.